Apollo 7, Wikipedia article audio. Apollo 7 was an October 1968 human spaceflight mission carried out by the United States. It was the first mission in the United States Apollo program to carry a crew into space. It was also the first U.S. space flight to carry astronauts since the flight of Gemini 12 in November 1966. The S-204 mission, also known as Apollo 1, was intended to be the first manned flight of the Apollo program. It was scheduled to launch in February 1967, but a fire in the cabin during a January 1967 test killed the crew. Manned flights were then suspended for 21 months, while the cause of the accident was investigated and improvements made to the spacecraft and safety procedures, and unmanned test flights of the Saturn V rocket and Apollo lunar module were made. Apollo 7 fulfilled Apollo 1's mission of testing the Apollo Command-Service module in low Earth orbit. The Apollo 7 crew was commanded by Walter M. Skira, with senior pilot-slash-navigator Don F. Isola, and pilot-slash-systems engineer R. Walter Cunningham. Official crew titles were made consistent with those that would be used for the manned lunar landing missions, Isola was command module pilot and Cunningham was lunar module pilot. Their mission was Apollo's C mission an 11-day Earth orbital test flight to check out the redesigned Block 2 CSM with a crew on board. It was the first time a Saturn IB vehicle put a crew into space, Apollo 7 was the first three-person American space mission, and the first to include a live TV broadcast from an American spacecraft. It was launched on October 11, 1968 from what was then known as Cape Kennedy Air Force Station, Florida. Despite tension between the crew and ground controllers, the mission was a complete technical success, giving NASA the confidence to send Apollo 8 into orbit around the moon two months later. The flight would prove to be the final space flight for all of its three crew members and the only one for both Cunningham and Isola when it splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean on October 22, 1968. It was also the only manned launch from Launch Complex 34, as well as the last launch from the complex. Crew Backup Crew Skira, Isola, and Cunningham were first named as an Apollo crew on September 29, 1966. They were to fly a second Earth orbital test of the original Block I Command-Service module after Apollo 1, the first manned flight, to be made by Virgil Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. In December 1966, the second mission was deemed redundant and cancelled, and Skira's crew were reassigned as Grissom's backup. Plans for the first manned Apollo flights were completely disrupted by the January 27, 1967 cabin fire which killed Grissom, White, and Chaffee. Skira, Isola, and Cunningham were later named as prime crew for the first manned flight which would now use the Block 2 spacecraft designed for the lunar missions. The command module and astronauts' spacesuits had been extensively redesigned to reduce and eliminate the chance of a repeat of the accident which killed the first crew. Skira thus became the only astronaut to fly Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions. His crew would test the life support, propulsion, guidance, and control systems during this open-ended mission. The duration was limited to 11 days, reduced from the original 14-day limit for Apollo 1. Since it flew in low Earth orbit and did not include the lunar module, Apollo 7 was launched with the Saturn IB booster rather than the much larger and more powerful Saturn V. Throughout the Mercury and Gemini programs, McDonnell aircraft engineer Gunter Wendt had been leader of the spacecraft launch pad teams, 
with ultimate responsibility for condition of the spacecraft at launch. He earned the astronauts' respect and admiration, including Skiras. However, the spacecraft contractor had changed from McDonnell to North American Rockwell, so Went was not the pad leader for Apollo 1. So adamant was Skira in his desire to have went back as pad leader for his Apollo flight, that he got his boss Deke Slayton to persuade North American management to hire went away from McDonnell, and Skira personally lobbied North American's launch operations manager to change went's shift from midnight to day so he could be pad leader for Apollo 7. Went remained as pad leader for the entire Apollo program. Went's face was the last they saw before the hatch was sealed, and immediately after liftoff Isola said with a mock German accent into his radio, I von der Veer Gunter Vend. Support Crew The first manned American space flight in 22 months lifted from LC-34 at 15 hours 2 minutes and 45 seconds UTC on Friday, October 11, 1968. Liftoff proceeded flawlessly, the Saturn IB performed well on its first manned launch and there were no significant anomalies during the boost phase. The astronauts described it as very smooth riding compared to the rough, bumpy Titan II used to launch the Gemini spacecraft. Following orbital injection and separation from the SIVB, the crew turned the CSM around using its reaction control system thrusters, and Isola practiced a simulated lunar module rendezvous and docking, using a visual reference target mounted inside the spacecraft adapter in the same radial position it occupied on the LM. One of the adapter panels on the SIVB failed to completely deploy to its 45-degree open position, Reminding Capcom Tom Stafford of his angry alligator experience on Gemini 9A, when docking was prevented by misdeployed adapter panels. Had this been an actual lunar mission, the astronauts might have found the process of LM extraction from the adapter more difficult, risking possible damage. This reinforced the decision to add a system to completely separate and jettison the panels on all subsequent Apollo Saturn V flights. Background The Apollo hardware and all mission operations worked without any significant problems, and the service propulsion system, the all-important engine that would place Apollo into and out of lunar orbit, made eight firings performing within 1% of the engine acceptance test thrust and specific impulse values. As the Saturn IB itself had performed very smoothly during launch, the astronauts were unprepared for the sudden violent jolt they received upon first activating the SBS, leading to Skira yelling Yabe Dabadu. In reference to the Flintstones cartoon, Don Isola called it a real boot in the rear. An assortment of minor hardware problems occurred over the flight, these included the drinking water hose trigger sticking during the final two days, a momentary undervoltage of the main AC buses caused by the automatic cryofan switch in the service module locks and LH2 tanks, and a loss of telemetry due to a malfunctioning electrical commutator following SM jettison at the end of the mission meaning that the final 15 minutes of data transmission were lost. Aside from the last event, which remained a mystery despite post-flight testing of the commutator, all of the problems on Apollo 7 were quickly resolved and some of them also involved equipment or procedures that would not be used on subsequent missions. Apollo promised the best food preparation yet seen on a manned spacecraft. For the first time, astronauts had both hot and cold water to prepare meals with and Wally Skira, who had had only toothpaste-like tubes for food on his Mercury flight, described the food as still does not match home cooking, but it comes a lot closer than space food used to. Thirty-three meals were provided for the three crewmen, 
allowing them three meals a day for each of the eleven days in space. Even so, the astronauts complained that there was more food than they could eat and that most of it was too sweet, although the menus had been prepared based on their personal preferences. Mission Highlights Early fears that the movement of the astronauts inside the CM would make it hard for the spacecraft's attitude control system to stabilize it proved unfounded, and they reported that motion was incredibly easy with no gravity to work against. As sleeping in the fetal position was cramping and painful, an exercise device called the Exergeny was provided. On-orbit operations Another mission goal was the first live television broadcast from an American spacecraft. It was initially scheduled for midday on day two, but Skira was concerned with the broadcast interfering with the rendezvous test. Mutiny in space Even though Apollo's larger cabin was more comfortable than Gemini's, 11 days in orbit took its toll on the astronauts. Tension with Skira began with the launch decision, when flight managers decided to launch with a less than ideal abort option for the early part of the ascent. Once in orbit, the spacious cabin may have induced some crew motion sickness, which had not been an issue in the earlier, smaller spacecraft. The crew were unhappy with their food selections, especially the high energy sweets. They also found the waste collection system cumbersome and smelly. But the worst problem occurred when Skira developed a severe head cold. As a result, he became irritable with requests from mission control and all three astronauts began talking back to the Capcom. An early example was this exchange after mission control requested that a TV camera be turned on in the spacecraft. Skira You've added two burns to this flight schedule, and you've added a urine water dump, and we have a new vehicle up here, and I can tell you at this point TV will be delayed without any further discussion until after the rendezvous, Capcom, Roger. Copy, Skira, Roger, Capcom 1, Apollo 7, this is Capcom number 1, Skira, Roger, Capcom 1. All we've agreed to do on this is flip it, Skira, with two commanders, Apollo 7, Capcom 1, all we have agreed to on this particular pass is to flip the switch on. No other activity is associated with TV, I think we are still obligated to do that, Skira, we do not have the equipment out, we have not had an opportunity to follow setting. We have not eaten at this point. At this point, I have a cold. I refuse to foul up our timelines this way. Reentry and post flight evaluation. A further source of tension between mission control and the crew was that Skira repeatedly expressed the view that the reentry should be conducted with their helmets off, contrary to previous Project Mercury and Gemini experience. They perceived a risk that their eardrums might burst due to the sinus pressure from their colds, and they wanted to be able to pinch their noses and blow to equalize the pressure as it increased during re-entry. This would have been impossible wearing the helmets, as the new Apollo helmets were a continuous fishbowl type without a movable visor, unlike previous helmets. However, on repeated occasions over the course of the mission, Skira was instructed that the helmets should be worn for safety reasons. In the final exchange on the subject, Mission Control made it clear to Skira that he would be expected to account for flouting instructions. Capcom number 1, OK. I think you ought to clearly understand that there is absolutely no experience at all with landing without the helmet on, Skira and there is no experience with the helmet either on that one, Capcom, that one we've got a lot of experience with, yes, Skira, if we had an open visor, I might go along with that, 
Capcom, OK. I guess you better be prepared to discuss in some detail when we land why we haven't got them on. I think you're too late now to do much about it, Skira, that's affirmative. I don't think anybody down there has worn the helmets as much as we have, Capcom, yes, Skira, we tried them on this morning, Capcom, understand that. The only thing we're concerned about is the landing. We couldn't care less about the re-entry. But it's your neck, and I hope you don't break it, Skira, thank you, babe, Capcom, over and out. Exchanges such as this led to Isola and Cunningham being rejected for future missions. If Apollo 7 was a mutiny, the Skylab mutiny could be compared to a full-blown rebellion, alternatively some have downplayed these as strikes or workplace tension, or simply the intricacies of working out the space flight workplace and planning environment. After Skylab, those mutineer astronauts did not fly again either, but neither did the most of the other astronauts in the Skylab program. NASA did not do another long-duration space flight of more than a couple weeks or so for over 25 years. The splashdown point was 27 degrees 32 minutes north 64 degrees 04 W slash 27.533 degrees north 64.067 degrees west slash 27.533. 200 nautical miles SSW of Bermuda and 7 NMI north of the recovery ship USS Essex. Despite the difficulties between the crew and mission control, the mission successfully met its objectives to verify the Apollo Command and Service Module's flight worthiness, allowing Apollo 8's flight to the moon to proceed just two months later. Apollo 7 was Project Apollo's only human spaceflight mission to launch from Cape Kennedy Air Force Station's Launch Complex 34. All subsequent Apollo and Skylab spacecraft flights were launched from Launch Complex 39 at the nearby Kennedy Space Center. Launch Complex 34 was declared redundant and decommissioned in 1969 making Apollo 7 the last human spaceflight mission to launch from the Cape Air Force Station in the 20th century. As of January 2017, Cunningham is the only surviving member of the crew. Isola died in 1987 and Skira in 2007. Mission Insignia the insignia for the flight shows a command and service module with its SBS engine firing, the trail from that fire encircling a globe and extending past the edges of the patch symbolizing the Earth orbital nature of the mission. The Roman numeral 7 appears in the South Pacific Ocean and the crew's names appear on a wide black arc at the bottom. The patch was designed by Alan Stevens of Rockwell International. Crew Honors After the mission, NASA awarded Skira, Isola, and Cunningham its Exceptional Service Medal in recognition of their success. On November 2, 1968, President Lyndon Johnson held a ceremony at the LBJ Ranch in Johnson City, Texas, to present the astronauts with the medals. He also presented NASA's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal, to recently retired NASA Administrator James E. Webb, for his outstanding leadership of America's space program since the beginning of Apollo. The Flight of Apollo 7 NASA Documentary Film at the Internet Archive Skira, Isola, and Cunningham were the only crew, of all the Apollo, Skylab, and Apollo Soyuz Test Project missions who had not been awarded the Distinguished Service Medal immediately following their missions. Therefore, NASA Administrator Michael D. Griffin decided to belatedly award the medals to the crew in October 2008, 
or exemplary performance in meeting all the Apollo 7 mission objectives and more on the first manned Apollo mission, paving the way for the first flight to the Moon on Apollo 8 and the first manned lunar landing on Apollo 11. Only Cunningham was still alive at the time, Isola's widow accepted his medal, and Apollo 8 crew member Bill Anders accepted Skira's. Other Apollo astronauts, including Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Alan Bean, were present at the award ceremony. Former flight director Christopher C. Kraft, Jr., who had been in conflict with the crew during the mission, sent a conciliatory video message of congratulations, saying, We gave you a hard time once but you certainly survived that and have done extremely well since. I am frankly, very proud to call you a friend. In January 1969, the Apollo 7 command module was displayed on a NASA float in the inauguration parade of President Richard M. Nixon. For nearly 30 years the command module was on loan to the National Museum of Science and Technology, in Ottawa, Ontario, along with the spacesuit worn by Wally Skira. In November 2003, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., requested them back for display at their new annex at the Stephen F. Udverhazy Center. Currently, the Apollo 7 Centimeters is on loan to the Frontiers of Flight Museum located next to Love Field in Dallas, Texas. On November 6, 1968, Comedian Bob Hope broadcast one of his variety television specials from NASA's Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston to honor the Apollo 7 crew. Barbara Eden, star of the popular comedy series I Dream of Jeannie, which featured two fictional astronauts among its regular characters, appeared with Skira, Isola, and Cunningham. Spacecraft Location Depiction in Media Gallery Skira parleyed the head cold he contracted during Apollo 7 into a television advertising contract as a spokesman for ActiFed, an over-the-counter version of the medicine he took in space. The Apollo 7 mission is dramatized in the 1998 miniseries From the Earth to the Moon episode We Have Cleared the Tower, with Mark Harmon as Skira. John Mees as Isolette, Frederick Len as Cunningham, and Max Wright as Went. A documentary, The Log of Apollo 7, has been restored from 16mm film and posted online. The Crew During Water Egress Training Apollo 7 in Flight Apollo 7 SIVB Rocket Stage in Orbit Distant view of the SIVB stage. View of Florida from Apollo 7. A crew member being hoisted into the recovery helicopter. The crew is welcomed aboard the USS Essex. Bibliography. Crew after recovery aboard USS Essex. This article incorporates public domain material from websites or documents of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Multimedia